Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Ricky. Thanks uh, everybody for being here, Yolanda. Thank you for being uh, the support that, uh, that that we need to continue to uh, go through our meeting. So, um, as I'm seeing the agenda, um, uh, it looks like the first is to um, call to the order. So we're calling the meeting to order. Um, we've got uh, uh, the first thing that I wanted to do then is to um, take a moment to have people introduce each other. Yolanda, is that is yeah, that good? We have to do the roll call first. So if I okay, Yolanda, you got it. Okay, uh, Montserrat Caballero. Present. Dominic Calza. Paul Cunningham. Jason Fried. Good afternoon. Herminia Frias. Stacy Giss. Present. Ross McAllister. Here. Taylor Pacheco. Here. Serena Preciado. Good evening, everyone. Dora Saldamando. Dr. Albert Fiqueros. Present. Xenia Vidal. Okay. That's Thank it. you very much, Yolanda. We have uh, a quorum then. Uh, just to just to be clear, as uh, as we move forward, uh, Yolanda, we need uh, what is what is uh, what constitutes quorum for this meeting? It would be seven. Seven. Yes. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Yes. So um, we we will have an issue if we don't have anybody else join and Ross pops off. So let's just we're going to try to move quickly. I don't know that we can get done by five, but hopefully one or two other individuals will join us. Uh, otherwise, we run. Uh, we don't. We can't continue. Um, thank you for for that piece, Yolanda. Um, uh, I'm going to take a very quick moment to ask people if they wouldn't mind introducing themselves because I know we have a couple of uh, new members. And so with that, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I, I will be in trouble with my wife and my mom if I don't allow the females to go first. So ladies, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves and then we'll have the gentleman go second. Taylor, why don't you go first? Sure. Hey guys, I am Taylor Pacheco. I'm currently an Algebra 1 teacher at Pueblo High School. Um, my background as far as wanting to join this, um, I was the coordinator of a CCLC program last year, so I have a little bit of the finance background with that. Um, I also run our um, Summer School Freshman Academy program, um, so it's good to be with you guys. Thank you, Taylor. Welcome. Um, Montserrat, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My apologies, my camera is off because I'm managing multiple devices in a space that's not great. So I'm afraid it, I won't be able to listen as well if I have my camera on. Um, Montserrat Caballero, I'm a TUSD parent and I don't know what else. Um, when Jason calls and tells you to do something, you you do it. Plus I am, uh. I'm a, I am a, uh, I don't know, overall involved, I guess, and like to have information. So I'm curious and excited to learn more. Thank you, Monsa. Um, Stacy, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Stacy Gist. I'm the principal of Valencia Middle School, and this is my second year on this committee, and it's been wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Stacy. Um, Serena, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Okay, I did just try to turn on my camera, but it says the host has stopped that. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Serena Preciado. I am the director of education for the Pascuayaki tribe and also a former um, educator, um, teacher, um, special education uh, and English for 12 years before this position. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Um, Albert, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself, please. Sure, th thank you. Um... Hello, everyone. My name is Albert Cicados, long-term educator in, in South Southern Arizona and Southwest Arizona, uh, close to 40 years or so, I think, although I lost uh, count. Uh, but anyhow, I'm, I'm excited to be here and uh, look forward to working with you all and uh, very honored to be part of this committee. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Ross, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Ross McAllister. I am um, have the 
pleasure of being appointed, uh, asked to be the liaison from the Southern Arizona Leadership Council. I uh, live in Tucson. I'm a um, uh, ex TUSD parent and um, and um, a businessman here in Tucson. Thank you, Ross. Um, it looks as though uh, Ricky got it fixed, so we can. Um, get the videos to work if it works, which uh, I must say everybody understands, and we've all been in that situation. Uh, Zoom world is is no is uh, we're all accustomed to that now. Um, uh, let's see here, who did I miss? Uh, myself, and then I'll have um, Ricky and and Robbie introduce themselves. Uh, Jason Freed, I'm a longtime uh, middle school math teacher, and I'm a parent of two TUSD students. I've got uh, a freshman at UHS and a sixth grader here with me at Alice Vale. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure to be on the committee last year and um, a, a little bit daunting to add to the roles that I, uh, that I continue to be chair. But thank you, I'm, I'm glad to have done this. Um, Ricky, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, my name's uh, Ricky Hernandez. <clears throat> I am the Chief Financial Officer here at Tucson Unified School District. I'm also a parent of two kids uh, in TUSD schools and kind of, First time caller, long time listener situation. So here I am. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, and then, uh, uh, pardon me, thank you, Ricky. Ravi, if you could introduce yourself, please. Of course. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Ravi uh, Shah, uh, board liaison um, from the, the governing board. Excited to be here today. Thank you. Um, we're going to jump to it then, folks. And again, um, We'll see if uh, Yolanda or Ricky, if you're able to, to try to message any of the other individuals who are not here, just as a follow-up to see if maybe they could join us, that would be appreciated. Um, and let's let's jump to it. Um, we've got, uh, are there any adjustments that need to be made to the agenda? All right. Um, I'm going back and forth screens. Okay, doesn't look like any, that's great. Um, so uh, let's see, it says guidelines to address the budget advisory committee. Um, would that be, would this be the time then Yolanda as for um, call to the audience? Yes, and we did not receive any comments for the meeting. Okay, so we've got no comments, no call to the audience. So we will move on into the agenda. Um, the next part is to appoint a vice chair. This has been a quite a comical um, piece to continue to add to our agenda. I will ask, uh, and honestly, I was prepped a week ago. I would have said, who cares? It doesn't really matter. I'm going to be here. Well, unfortunately, I've got some family situations that are happening, and there, I could literally get a phone call right now and say, I'm really, really sorry. It's an emergency. I have to go. And so if we could um, have a vice chair, I'm not planning on those things happening, and I will hopefully not have them happen, but stuff happens. So if um, somebody is willing to self-nominate or nominate somebody else, I'd love to be able to have us uh, have a, a vice chair. I nominate Stacy. Stacy. Um, although I'm grateful this year, I'm serving as the president of Eli, and with everything else going on, it's been a, a bit much. So I try to be here, but I'm starting to see little cracks. So I would I will turn down that nomination this time. But next year, hopefully, maybe. And just again, this really is. I, I hopefully it's it's unnecessary. I'm not. I mean, I don't see any reason why it would be other than literally right now. They're good. You know, I've got some stuff going. Uh, Ross, did you serve as the, as the vice chair last year? I did. Yeah. It's no big. It's nothing. It's nothing, Ross. So since it's nothing, would you mind continuing in such a capacity? Oh yeah, sure. All right. Um, we have been, uh, I made that motion. Uh, if I could get a second, please. Second. I, second. That's why I nominated Stacy. I know. I did. The, Rossi missed the first meeting. That's exactly yep. the tact that I tried. I, it was a preemptive well, strike. Yes, well done. You and I think alike in that regard. That's for sure. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, uh, Yolanda, I don't think, I think we can do this through a voice vote. So um, all in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross, for stepping forward. Um, and just to be clear, and I've said this in the previous meetings and I'll say this as we continue to meet, um, the informality of first names um, has been something that everybody has been comfortable with um, and hopefully we can continue to do so. Uh, it just allows us to see each other um, and, and the, you know, we've got formal work that we need to do. 
um, but it's okay to just check in with each other a little bit on, um, you know, on, on pleasantries of just our first names. Um, we have minutes from the last meeting from the September 29th meeting. Um, I believe that we need a motion to accept those minutes. Can somebody please move to accept those? So moved. Thank you, Russ. Can I get a second, please? I second. Thank you. Is there any uh, is there any uh, changes that need to be made? If not, no. Okay, then we're going to take a voice vote. All in favor of approval of those minutes, please say aye. 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 Wonderful. Any abstention? Any uh, any noes? Any abstentions? Thank you uh, very much. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to abstain since I was not at that meeting. Understood. Thank you, Albert. Uh, we've got that motion, the motion passes, and we uh, we have approved those minutes. Um, so the next item is 4.03, which is the, the rescheduling of uh, future agenda items. Um, uh, uh, so Ravi and I had some conversation, and, um, and I'm going to pass this over to him on some action that the board took, which will free uh, us up a little bit. So Ravi, if you wanted to talk about the action for, uh, regarding TUVA, that would be great. Right, I think it was uh, one or two meetings uh, ago, early October, end of September, uh, there was a presentation from staff about combining uh, some programs together, uh, TUVA along with um, uh, credit recovery, if I remember correctly, um, that's done online. So we've already approved uh, as a governing board uh, some changes to TUVA um, and to combine it together and to rebrand some of the things and have it be a permanent uh, funded uh, program in TUSD. So that was one of the uh, items, priority items that the board had approved in the springtime was to look at TUVA, look at online education in the virtual space. Uh, that's probably not as ripe right now, uh, considering some uh, really important decisions that are going to be coming down the pipeline on uh, ESSER funding uh, positions and, and future use of ESSER funds. Uh, so when, when Jason and I spoke, we uh, thought that it might be best for uh, the, the back to really focus in on uh, three instead of uh, four different uh, categories. Uh, the literacy that we've already started that will hopefully conclude today. I'll look at it, ESSER um, uh, funding, and there's two categories there specifically with ESSER, and, and then going into capital funding, which is to me some major um, changes and some uh, important budgetary decisions uh, that we'll be having on, on the ESSER side. Uh, and then the two uh, issues on, on, the, on ESSER uh, will be first, um, the, the funding that is remaining, and we had a conversation during our TUSD governing board meeting a few meetings ago about the remaining funding and potential uses of the funding, a few million that is left to stay compliant with um, the regulations and rules of the ESSER funding. Uh, and then also all the ESSER funded positions, uh, the, the multi-millions that we've spent to try to help on recovery and other uh, needs of our students um, in a post-COVID world. You know, what are the most evidence-based ones for continuation? How do we fund those positions out of the MNO, Title I, DSEG, and other budgets? And what to do with these positions um, that, um, that are funded through ESSER um, that won't be funded uh, in a couple of uh, months, if not a year or two. And so uh, our recommendation would be uh, to change the, the schedule of meetings, um, uh, the agendas rather of our meetings coming up to reflect uh, more time towards ESSER. So we had three meetings for ESSER, a prelim now, uh, a follow-up in prelim uh, at the next meeting and a follow-up uh, in, in the third meeting to discuss some of the issues with ESSER and hold off on TUVA at this point, either for a future year's agenda or something in the spring, if we were to continue meeting in the springtime or sometime in the, in the future or just or, or let the governing board manage that itself. Oh, perfect, Robbie. So thank you for clarifying that point. So just to make sure that we follow um, what we've done, we had our last meeting talking about literacy. Um, this first half of this meeting then would be to attempt to wrap up the literacy component um, concluded with uh, a, um, a recommendation. Um, and then moving forward, the second half of this being about how we would use um, the remaining ESSER funds. And that would be the conversation for the first half, concluding that the next meeting in the first half and then the second half being talking about um, you know, what, what positions are currently being funded um, by ESSER and what positions we find the most value in um, and, and maybe what things uh, have, have less value. And that would be concluded in the following meeting. So, um, so yeah, so 
it just structurally gives us that because we had wanted two ESSER me meetings and we lost that. And now we have that back by not having two of um, If there is a problem with that, please unmute um, and share it because uh, I don't want to move forward if that's uncomfortable for anybody. It just seems as though TUVA would be um, redundant since the board made uh, action already. Is there any concerns with that, with us progressing in this manner? Cool. Okay. And that's how we're going to move. Um, so with that, then we move into uh, the informational items 5.01, where we're going to continue the discussion about um, uh, budget priority literacy and language uh, proficiencies. I'm not sure then, uh, uh, Ricky, if there's uh, anybody else who is supposed to be joining us um, who has some, you know, some information to share. No, there, there are no staff presentations <clears throat> for this part. Okay. So whatever um, they presented at, you know, in what, late September is all we've got. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't know if through those discussions, um, uh, and maybe Robbie, I don't know if you wanted to to um, if there was some some components that you felt uh, were of real significance that you'd like to see us make some kind of a motion on. Uh, and again, it, what we did in the past is we attempted to draft these and then uh, brought them together at the last meeting as one full recommendation um, with multiple components. Um, Robbie, so I'm going to pass it over to you. So I followed up with uh, Dr. Trujillo um, after the last meeting. I think a lot of my questions weren't answered yet. Um, and I'm not, um, if you don't know, remember the committee, I wouldn't know really what we're to do in terms of a recommendation. You know, the information I was really looking for is, you know, what are all of the possible interventions that we can be doing to help uh, improve literacy uh, for our students? Um, what are the ones that have the most evidence for improved outcomes? Uh, kind of like we did for those of you who on the committee last year, kind of like we did for um, increased classroom sizes. We looked at uh, that versus a bunch of other interventions that we could do uh, as a district uh, to help improve outcomes for the students. We saw that increasing classroom sizes uh, were kind of in the midline, middle level of you know making a difference for um, academic achievement for our students. Um, we looked at the data about what we were already doing as a district on uh, classroom sizes. You know um, where where the classroom sizes were larger and, and smaller. Um, and then we were able to conclude as a, as a group last year that that wasn't somewhere that we could really you know, make much of an of a impact um, and it wouldn't be worth our, our, our investment in, in that at this point, considering other things that we could do. So I was hoping for something similar to that uh, in literacy, you know, looking at you know, libraries and librarians, you know, funding for, for those positions, funding for the MTSS coordinators and literacy uh, coaches and other kind of support systems that we have. You know, what are the ones that really have the biggest bang for our buck in terms of we have this positions uh, really focusing on, on this type of work, uh, literacy recovery uh, interventions, all the different positions that we have for working one on one with students or supporting the teachers uh, with literacy interventions. Things we can do on library and librarians have been a big push on that um, uh, from certain governing board members and community members on that piece. You know, what are the things and other other things that we can do in terms of the categories um, and what are the what are the benefit that they have for our students. Uh, and looking at the ones that have the most benefit um, and, and seeing what the sources, what we're doing already, what the sources of funding are and what we can do. So I don't, I don't feel that I've really had those, uh, that those questions answered. I'm not sure if other people feel that they have uh, information they need to, to make some recommendations. And I wonder, Jason, if um, the staff is, isn't ready with that information yet, whether to, to really kind of focus today's meeting on some of the, the budgetary issues with, um, with Esther, with Ricky being here um, and um, really kind of, Coming to coming back with uh, some literacy, some some more information in a future meeting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, you know, uh, I think I would probably echo that. Um, I thought the presentation last um, last month was extensive. I don't know that I had something that was conclusive in the same way as you brought up that you know class sizes was not something that was nearly as conclusive as some people might have thought in improving test scores or achievement. Um, and so I think. We, there was a lot of information. I actually have just pulled up the, the PowerPoint that they shared um, with us. I didn't personally find something that was um, like clear and compelling. Um, I'll open it to the floor and see if anybody had any other thoughts. Because if not, if we're not in a place of making a recommendation, um, I certainly don't want us to sit and wait and would rather move forward. Does anybody have any thoughts about the presentation um, or a potential recommendation um, moving forward?
Um, okay, well, then what I think we'll do is I will um, try to make sure that, that Ravi and I circle back to this um, in a future meeting. And it, as we have some conversation, see if there is something that looks a little bit more clear uh, and when it comes to a recommendation. I mean, we know that there is learning loss. We know that, that the, the need of um, strong support when it comes to literacy is there. And yet, I, I don't know, um, I don't know right now, it seems that, that we would have a, a recommendation. So with that then, um, I think, you know, Ravi, your suggestion makes some sense. And I think we should just move forward unless there's objection to move forward to the second item. Okay, I'm not seeing any uh, objection. So um, the, the second half of this uh, focus is for us to look at ESSER funded positions and um, I, I believe that's Ricky who's gonna be going through that with us. And um, for us, our focus for this meeting, this meeting and the first half of the next meeting is looking at here's the remaining funds. What are the kinds of things that we should be doing with that, those remaining funds with the understanding that the follow-up to that would be, what are some things that have been funded through ESSER that we would say as a committee should continue to be a priority in TUSD. So just kind of helping everybody to focus their lens. So lens is what should we do with remaining funds now? And then in the future, what should the district continue to fund even when ESSER dries up? Um, Ricky, you ready to take, the, take it over? Yeah, yeah. So Great. yeah, just so just to piggyback off what Jason was saying, this is gonna be kind of a little bit of both. So it, it will talk a little bit about positions just because it goes hand in hand with the remaining balance of dollars in ESSER. So, you know, that is, I don't know, probably like 90% as is everything else of what we are spending ESSER is on people. So I, we want to make sure that we provide you that information. John Lanza was going to be here, our senior director of grants, but he is flying back uh, from the East Coast and he is in the middle of the air right now. So, uh, so all you got is me. Uh, let me see. All right, can you all see that? Cool, all righty. So like I mentioned, this is just gonna be kind of like an overview funding staffing update. Feel free to interrupt me in the middle of it if you've got questions or you can save your questions for the end. Um, I will be happy to kind of entertain whatever you got. All right, so, so what's our kind of funding status at this point? So ESSER, remaining ESSER right now, we've got about $19.1 million kind of sitting in the bucket. The, the one piece that we have to remember, or the one thing, the one caveat with ESSER is that we are required to use 20% of our total ESSER funding for what's called academic learning loss, right? So what are we doing to provide interventions to students be, as a result of the pandemic to mitigate, slow, you know, what have you, um, the issue of academic learning loss? <clears throat> so, we're required, you know, with the remaining funds to spend $14.8 million um, for this academic loss. Uh, there's an alloc unallocated balance of just over $4 million available. And, and, you know, some of the biggest chunks for why we now have to kind of refocus this last year of ESSER funding has to do with the three things kind of on the side. You know, we're doing these $7,500 retention stipends that were approved last spring. Those are, you know, first payment goes out in December. Those are $63 million worth of funding. Um, allocations of $350,000 that we were given, that we're, we gave to every one of those schools, we are eliminating those for next school year, for the school year that starts uh, August of 23. That's about $30.5 million. Um, the overall set aside is $34.6 million. What remains is we have to still spend another $14.8 million for that academic loss goal. So what are we what are we kind of looking for at this point? So the academic loss requirement is 34 and a half. You can see that these are a list of various activities that the district has undertaken in order to try to meet that academic loss requirement. Summer school um, in the last three in the last two years, summer school this coming summer, there are approved positions that were approved last school year, this school year, 
and uh, up to 30%, well, not up to, but 30% of the cost of kindergarten all meet the academic loss. Now, that's where we still have this $14.5 million requirement, right? So we still need to kind of meet that requirement. And I'm going to show you what the proposal has been from the grants department on what that would look like. In regards to the approved positions, I do want to make sure that I point you to the in the direction of that right hand side of the screen. These are the academic loss positions that the Arizona Department of Education has said these qualify to meet this academic loss requirement. So it, we have a lot of positions, obviously, within ESSER that don't fall within this, that are going to have to find a new home in terms of funding. Um, and before I continue too far, a copy of this presentation is posted with the agenda. So the PDF is there just in case you miss anything, you'll be able to kind of go back and look at the PDF of this, of, of, uh, this item. So, you know, right now we've definitely made great progress towards that. And what John particularly has done is what more can we do in order to, you know, in order to address the remaining portion of the academic loss requirement. So these are some of the recommendations. Those approved positions that you saw in the prior slide, keeping those for one more year. So those, those RTI teachers, those math interventionists, those reading interventionists, the whole you know, scope of those positions, keeping those one more school year. So going into fiscal year 24, um, that's $4.7 million. Funding kindergarten, 30% of kindergarten, one more year, another $3.6 million. And funding summer school, not just the summer of 23, but the summer of 24. So right before ESSER basically kind of closes for good, those, these are the kind of the three big things. The two items at the bottom, the ones that are asterisk, the high school credit recovery program and the school turnaround program, those were recommended and approved by the governing board when this part of this presentation was given to them in late September. So that $896,900,000 basically is already taking, you know, moving forward just because those needed immediate implementation. We couldn't, you know, we didn't want to wait until December when we're going back to the governing board to get that work started already. But this is our recommendation. This is the, the grants department and, you know, and curriculum instruction. This is leadership's recommendation on how to meet that $14 million goal. What are the next steps, right? So you've got this $19 million balance. We spend this $14.8 million on those recommendations. If they are approved by the governing board, this is, this is the one thing is none of that has been okayed by the board. These are just kind of what we think would be a, a good way to answer the call on spending funding for academic learning loss. We still have an un unallocated amount of $4.2 million. That's kind of the biggest question is, what this remaining 4.2 um, can be done. And obviously this is based on what we know today. You know, people leave, they retire, things change. So that balance can certainly change over the course of the, of the remaining months in the fiscal year. So the, uh, you know, continue those approved positions which are already in that $14.8 million line item. Now ADE has unapproved, if you will, some of the positions that we currently have in ESSER that cannot continue into the school year starting August of 23. Um, the biggest chunks are CSPs, curriculum service providers, and MTSSs. Uh, there are 49 positions valued at $3.2 million that have to be eliminated from ESSER uh, by the end of the school year. So we have to find alternative sources to those things. Go ahead, Ravi or Jason. Um. Thank you. I just wanted to then clarify when, because it, it says ADE unapproved. Um, can you, I, I guess I don't, I don't understand that phrasing and I don't know why the district wouldn't be able to make an, that determination. So can you clarify? Yeah, that? so, so AD, so those positions were already, they've been funded through ESSER and because we're not achieving that goal in terms of the dollars of the spend on academic learning loss, they've narrowed the definition of what positions meet the definition of that academic learning loss. What the argument has been presented by the district to ADE in terms of how that's defined, that's something that I would defer to John as to what specifically they said why this can't be considered 
in academic learning loss position. Um, obviously, most of these CSPs work more with teachers and they work with students. So the, the idea is interventions for kids is really what they're looking for. I mean, there's a lot that can be, you can definitely articulate this in different ways, but at this point, this is what the Department of Education is saying. I would certainly phrase that question to John and, and he can, when, when we meet again in the next month, he can certainly come back and better articulate than I can. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think, that. yeah, I think as we move forward um, for the next meeting, whether it's John being part of it or you clarifying that, that would be helpful because <laughs> those were positions that existed. Um, you know, those, those are not necessarily new positions to TUSD, um, just, just different funding source. So getting that clarification would be helpful. So, I mean, as I understand it, we could continue to choose to fund those positions, just not with ESSER funds. Um, but that clarification would be helpful. Um, okay. Taylor, if you, thank you, Taylor, if you wanted to go next. Yeah, I'm probably mostly just gonna echo what you said. I would also like to know that um, it sounds like these positions were also what we were discussing for the language and literacy interventions. And so I'm curious if the reason for unapproving these is that they're not research-based or they weren't um, showing effectiveness. So that would be helpful for our um, determination yeah. literacy. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Taylor. Um, Stacy. Um, I've been working with ADE on some of these, some other grant stuff, and and the, I don't know if John's going to echo the same thing, but what they were telling me is it had to work directly with students, so curriculum service providers, um, and multi-tiered system of support where they were the way ADE was interpreting them was they were working with adults and systems in place and even teaching assistants. I know that John and them were, were in communication with ADE because teaching assistants are, a lot of them are for pull out programs, but they weren't teacher of record. And so that's really where it had to be. So I know they were going back and really looking at the um, job description because, a, because if it falls under teaching assistants, like in a regular classroom, they're just there to support, which is not like student academic loss. But the way they're being currently utilized in schools is like a pullout program for RTI and stuff. So I know that there was big discussions that in one of the other meetings that I've been in um, to help ADE understand how we were utilizing them here. Yeah, in, in the regional meetings that the principals all got there. Is, so the teaching assistants that were used, like how Stacy described, they're just in the classroom, just kind of supporting the teacher. Those can no longer be considered you know, for this academic learning loss. However, there is a very, a more narrowly tailored definition and there's criteria that principals receive to say, if you can outline these criteria for the use of your TAs, then we can continue to fund your TAs. But you have to make sure that you kind of put in the effort to say, how are they actually providing interventions to these kids? And there's criteria that ADE provided to John and that criteria, my understanding at least has been disseminated to the principals or will be coming to the principals or they can receive it from their, um, their contact at grants in order to work with them on outlining those responsibilities to meet the academic loss. Okay, um, thank you. Stacy. did you have a follow-up? I, I did, I just wanted to say when we do, when we do have a position that's ESSER funded, we also have some ADE requirements as a principal and that position to verify they are working um, with students, it, it's like 70 or 80% of the time, it might even be higher. I, I don't use the actual math to me. So I know in those positions that were even titled, their work was not meeting that capacity at that time for ESSER. Okay, right. thank, thank but you. But so and, good for schools. <laughs> of course, yeah. Well, and I think that's another piece that we're gonna need to go through. Um, that's, that's really, in some ways, I think I'm speaking uh, more to Ravi than anybody else. The people who moved into these positions, um, many of them did so right at, at the request of their administrators. And so they're really doing, trying to do good work for our schools. If these positions themselves, if their funding source goes away and hence the positions go away, um, you know, I think we, we've got to find a way to make sure that we take care of those employees. That was something that was a high priority last school year. Absolutely. Um... You know, there's a lot of open positions. You know, we talked about wait vacancy savings at the last governing board meeting. Uh, I mean, a lot of positions exist. And I think one of the goals with the literacy discussion was to look at those positions and see, okay, these are really 
you know, these are positions that are really making an impact um, for, for literacy or for math or whatever other programs are working on, because some of the MTSS coordinators and CSPs are working on, on different pieces of the, of the puzzle on the, on the reading, writing, and arithmetic. And um, you know, seeing what additions are gonna end in ESSER um, come, come end of the school year, does it make sense? Is it worth it to find a way to put it into the MNO budget or to find other sources of funding for these positions and where that's gonna come from? I think that's some important questions to ask. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's really worth to, to really strain the MNO budget or to look for other sources of funding. Is, is, a, is an MTSS coordinator in a school gonna um, make more of an impact for the students than, a, than a, uh, if you use Title I funding than um, a community liaison, for example, or some of these other positions that we have in Title I and DSAG and other, other sources of funding that we have. So I think really looking at these positions in terms of the impact that they're making is gonna be a really important decision point um, for, the, for the budget in terms of we're, we're not, we don't have $250 million all of a sudden to be able to spend and, and you know, throw at the wall and see what sticks in terms of trying to make an impact for our students because we had the funding we were able to do something that we usually can't do, which is just do everything all at once and hope that something makes an impact for some of our of our most vulnerable kids. And we're going to have to make some tough decisions on where we spend the money uh, in the in the months and in the year or two ahead. So I think having that data is going to be really important on what's what's really making an impact. And then how to, if it does, doesn't make that much of an impact, and how to revamp these positions or how to change these these people that we have in the roles into other positions that make um, more sense for a limited budget uh, a school district that we'll be having again after in a post tester world. Thank you. Um, Ricky, if you'll continue, thank you. Sure. Okay, so that's that's where we are with these. Um, <clears throat> so next steps. So the unfilled ESSER positions, because we still have quite a number of them, those are gonna be closed by tomorrow. So if we have vacancies in any one of these positions that have gone unfilled as of tomorrow, we're shutting those down. Uh, the only ones that may be given an exception are these, you know, like hourly ones, like certified academic tutors, for example, because, you know, usually those are our existing teaching staff that are being provided this hourly rate to then work with their kids. But hiring full-time positions, if we haven't gotten them by now, we need to close it more than anything to allow principals in particular the time to use the funding that they do have available for other things, for other interventions, for other work that they would like to do before the fiscal year ends. Because like I said at the beginning, their, their allocation is, you know, is gone by the end of the, of the school year. Um, currently there is about 78 FTE that are outside the CSP MTSS position. So we do have other positions beyond just those that need to be addressed by the end of the fiscal year. So in addition to the ones that I showed you in the prior slide, we've got an additional 78 FTEs that don't fall within the scope of either being an M a CSP, an MTSS, or one of those academic loss positions. That's about $3.1 million. All in, we've got about 510 FTE, about 18.1 million that need to be addressed. Approximately half of those FTEs are some form of teaching position which can include you know, the RTI teachers, the math intervention teachers, the reading intervention teachers, about $9.1 million by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, Ravi, you had a question? When you say they need to be addressed, it means um, these are all ESSER funded positions that no longer have funding after this academic year? Yeah. Or, and the same thing for the third bullet point? Yeah, for the third bullet point, it's by the end of ESSER. So I, you know, half of those, our teachers, but some of that mix of those 226 are the ones that are approved for the academic loss piece. So not all 226 need to be addressed by the end of the fiscal year, but we've got just who are, you know, regular classroom teachers, right? That some, some did it for, you know, to achieve lower class sizes, for example, by opening up another classroom, they added another teacher, but there's not a specific intervention that they're, that they're providing for the student. So the third bullet point is that the 22, 23, at the end of 23, we don't have funding or is that for the 23, 24 year, we don't have funding? That's mo that for the most part, it's 23, 24. The, a, a significant chunk of those um, is gonna be 23, 24. All right, so it's a 24, 25 right. budget in two years that we're really- Yeah. We're out with, do with those $18 million worth of positions. Yeah, yes. And-, and All these are filled I'll, right now or are, are these also a lot of- uh, these, are all, these are all filled. These are not vacancies. Yeah, these are people, the people are in them. 
So there's just, to, just I wanted to make sure you could reiterate that piece, Ricky. Which school year would these positions no longer have funding for? So these 510 FTE will no longer have funding at all by June 30th of 2024. Okay, so there so would be funding into, through next this school year and next school year. For and so and so then I want to clarify one point. Some of the funding will stop for some positions if they don't meet the academic loss requirement. So and that, that goes 226, back to that previous. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So some of these 226 will stop by the end of this fiscal year. Um the 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 goal, I guess you can say, is trying to work with HR to try to identify existing teaching vacancies where some of these teaching staff can then go back into. Um, that's, I mean, obviously that's a much larger process and we haven't identified what that looks like, but at least for the teaching staff, you know, we, we feel at least that, you know, come, come the spring, there might be a sufficient FTE available, but that's a to be determined number because we haven't done the work behind that. Any other questions? Oh, the end. Questions? Anything else? It looks like uh, Ross, if you wanted to go, please. Can you go back to that slide, last slide, Ricky? <laughs> yeah, give me one second. So said another way, um, there's a $21 million shortfall based on the current position, some of which that when ESSER funds go away, then we we're, we're, we have a $21 million budget shortfall. Is that Appro you know? approximately? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Because we do have other positions that are not teacher positions that are, I mean, frankly, to be determined. Okay. Taylor? Yeah, on the slide that said ESSER academic loss recommendations, uh, or actually, sorry, the one before it, it had um, the three different years of summer school there. What's the reason for the jump in the 2023? I honestly, I don't know. I will, I'll check with, I believe it, it was just, we provided much larger programs, but maybe Dr. Ravi knows. I think there's other sources of funding for the 21, 22 years, and we use mostly ESSER for 23. I think it's just what's coming out That's of ESSER. That's true. Those That's years, correct. if I correctly, from the prior conversations. Okay. And um, do you also happen to have a breakdown of, like, um, for the summer school or for these intervention teachers, um, where it's being spent as far as, like, elementary, middle school, high school? Not offhand, but we do. And we can certainly provide that back to the committee if that's something you'd like. Thank you. So just out of curiosity, if if ESSER is for academic loss, uh, why would kindergarten be in that category since theoretically these are kids who are just coming? I, I am going to turn that over to the very gracious and smiling Stacy Gist, <laughs> since she is the educational leader amongst the group. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I, I'm sure that, Ricky, you know that, that we don't get fully funded for kinder. Right. So we have to pick up from the state. So we right. have to pick up the cost of kinders for a, a full day program. Um, I'm going to go also, back. It, it's also I'm an gonna, intervention to a certain yes, extent. Yes, I'm going to yeah. go back a ways when, I don't remember, it's probably 10 years ago when there was a big budget shortfall and we had to have parents start paying for kindergarten to go full day, um, might've been closer to seven. We did experience because I, I was a principal of an elementary at that time and parents had to pay for the full day or their kids only went half day. We did experience as principals, there was an academic loss for kids um, in that second year and or that first year and that second year. Um, and we start Dibbles training or Dibbles testing um, in, I think it's first grade. Sorry, I've been out of, I'm in middle school now. Um, and so whether they can learn their sounds and all of that. So mm -hmm. 
so there is, it does work to make sure we're funding full day kinder. Um, and we have seen that even nationally um, for that so that they can get ready because it's really important for reading. Okay, thank you. Um, Jason, <clears throat> I can call back on my phone and while I'm driving to my next meeting and that way you can keep a quorum if you want. Um, yeah, so Ross, if you, it, let's, let's do it that way. Keep yourself in because okay. if you drop off, then we immediately lose our quorum. Right. Um, so Call keep yourself in and, and do it on your phone off. and then drop one. Yeah, that would be okay. really helpful. Thank you, Ross. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, so oh, wait a second. Looks like I don't have to leave till 530. So I'm good. Oh, okay. So we should just be okay. We're not awesome, good. Ross. And, and, and just, just as an, just uh, for everybody, um, you know, if we can be done by five, we will try by five in general. Um, but uh, I do think, um, you know, 530 is just a little bit safer. Robbie. Sure, Ricky. Uh, there were some decision points. I mean, we made some decisions. We approved some things at the the I think the October six governing board meeting on ESSER funding, um, but there were still some un unanswered questions on remaining funding uh, expenditure. Is that uh, right for this conversation today, or are you going to hold that for another conversation? Uh, yeah, we can hold that for another one because I didn't actually start collecting. This is just kind of where we are as of um, when we gave you this presentation. You and the rest of the board members, Ravi, at the end of September. Yeah. Um, but in terms of what's still left, we'll know more after we close all the vacancies tomorrow. We'll have a better sense of how much money is still sitting in the bucket um, for our proposal that we will take to, you know, we're still planning to take that to the board in December, um, which is kind of why we were hoping the BAC would kind of tackle some of the legwork in October, November. Okay, I, I think then, um, Ricky, as we're moving forward, Right, because the next piece starts uh, asking, what information do we need? I know there's been a couple of questions that have been asked already to you, and I know you're getting those down. Um, you know, I, I think, and actually, um, to to the point as far as literacy, there was, and we go back to that slide uh, near the end. There was like a list of some things they, you know, I remember they wanted to have um, some adoptions. There hasn't been a new language arts adoption, or some of those other components. Um, so. So I do think that's probably going to be worthwhile for all of us to maybe take a uh, maybe just a moment as we go through those. As I look through, um, as we draft the next agenda item or the next agenda part of me for our next meeting, I may have a start with just looking at that one slide, and that may lead us towards some recommendations as well as mixed with some information that Robbie may uh, be able to to sprinkle in there. Um, but I, I do think getting to uh, some really clear information so that then we may not be able to say dollars and cents, hey, spend this dollar amount on this, this dollar amount on that, but sharing that as a committee, it seems as though we, we find value in this over that. We recommend this being a greater priority as opposed to something else. And I think that could be um, helpful to the governing board and then to, to uh, you on the finance side to say to the governing board, BAC was recommending these, not necessarily tying it to dollars as much as it was ta ta tying it to success and what they uh, thought had the most uh, bang for the buck. Robbie? Yeah, this is a really daunting task um, you know, for any, any group, for the leadership team, for the board, and of course, for the budget advisory committee to really come up with a game plan here. We have what 500 to 600 FTEs worth of positions that we're talking about, and these range from counselors and behavioralists, you know, to those MTSS coordinators and, and CSPs to teachers and and you know other so many other other ways that you know we've been able to spend uh, all this money. So there's, there's really a, a variety of different positions, and so I think you know. <sighs> And thinking of what is the best way to figure out what to do with all these positions, you know, is, is multifold. You know, there's an HR question, you know, what positions are filled? How many are empty? There's no reason to cut positions when we have staff when there's nowhere else for them to go. Like if we have all of our counselor positions filled, great, let's just keep them because we can't hire other positions or, you know, and, and I think there's an HR question of what's filled, what's not filled, you know, what is the market like? If we keep certain uh, roles in the district and find other sources of funding, but not this, but we have these people hired and we can't move them, then I think that's going to be a whole HR, you know, issue of you know what do we actually have filled or what do we what do we have empty? I mean, as Ricky said, these positions are actually full positions. And the question is, you know, 
we know all these things, you know, make a difference. Yeah, it's great to have, you know, the counselor's behavioral. I've been, you know, as a physician, I've been a big supporter of making sure we address mental health for our students. You know, we also know that, you know, having the teacher supported through those, you know, curriculum service providers and, and folks that are putting together the PDs and other things and other um, ways that teachers are supported to be more effective is important and, and direct interventions for our students are more important and the smaller classroom settings that are, are, are important in, in their own way as well. But we can't do everything once the extra money uh, runs out. So really figuring out, you know, finding a way to really have those conversations, you know, with some data about what's going to really make the most impact. You know, how do we how do we find the best balance of these different types of interventions to um, look at? You know, are we going to do this only for the lowest income, you know, schools, or are we can do this for, you know, try to do a little bit at each school, or you know, what is the best way that we can really move the needle for our students? Um, in our district. And then also then, you know, Ricky coming in with your team and other team members that are doing, you know, with John and other folks about, all right, here's what our Title I budget looks like. Here's what we can and can't use this money for. You know, uh, we've had conversations about, you know, you know, and Stacey can speak to this, you know, the principals love having control over the Title I budget. You know, do we have to centralize all the Title I money and, and then be more um, prescriptive in terms of how that gets used? The same thing with the DSEG. Now that we're off the DSEG, you know, uh, court supervision, you know, we have more control as a governing board on how uh, we allocate the money to address um, issues of um, of, uh, of uh, uh, disequity in, in, in academics and, and desegregation issues. And what can we use for our DSEG budget or 60, you know, some odd million dollars to support some of these positions, both in terms of money we don't have to spend on special masters and legal costs and other kinds of things that are immediately drop off and then money we can reallocate to from things that maybe have less evidence for improvement of outcomes that can have more of these things. So I think there's a really broad conversation that, that we need to have as a group and as a, as, a, as a district to figure out what to do with these 500 some odd positions you know, moving forward. But, well, that's, I mean, all that's well said, um, Robbie. And I think Ricky, that, that makes uh, your work and you know the, the folks that you're going to work with um, all the more daunting because I think the more succinct that we can be in sharing with everybody on this committee, the easier we're going to be able to to make a recommendation. Um, you know, I mean, I know based on those who were who were on the committee last year, there was a high high value in take care of our own, right? I mean, and that's putting that just in, you know, but that. Um, that I know that that had high value. And so as we go through this process, right, and, and Robbie talking about HR, that's gonna be integral, even though that has, that's not the work that we get to do, but, um, but that's something that I know that was a high priority. But I think being able to be really clear about here's, this is a real person in this real position and how many real people are in these real positions uh, and so on, to, so we could we could look and how many of those are not you know won't, when when that funding goes away just I mean I I, I don't um, I just think the only downside of the literacy presentation was it was it was so it was like really meaty which is good but it's really hard to be to narrow that down into one or two recommendations so I think that could be really helpful is to to really talk about who the people are not you know but how many people are in those positions, the impacts of those positions, um, so that then we can, we can kind of digest that a little bit easily, a little more easily in, uh, as we move forward. Um, Ricky, I know you want to make a comment. So, the, I mean, we've, we've, I, we've started to identify some of that stuff. <clears throat> the only small concern I have with bringing some of it is because the board hasn't heard it. So, I mean, so, I mean, if, if, if Robbie has no issues with it, or if he wants to kind of take that to Dr. Trujillo about it, but you know, we we have strategized as to saying this is the narrow universe of positions we think need to carry on beyond the life of Esser, right? So we've done it's ultimately just identifying the dollars and cents to make that recommendation fit, in addition to some of the other things that John and his team and Flory and her team have been already doing to try to say, what can we fit um, into existing funding sources like Title I? Um, Ravi's point is also well taken by the rest of us in the sense that 
you know, we can say or we can dictate we should be funding out of Title I this, this, and this, but because we've essentially kind of decentralized Title I, we've given that authority, that responsibility to our building principles, um, it's kind of like a... <laughs> It's like an arm wrestling match between me and Stacy, basically, to see who wins, <laughs> to try to say, are we going to fund your fill in the blank at Valencia? And, you know, let's kind of arm wrestle for it, because that's, you know, unless we centralize the whole pot of money. And so that those are some of the more nuanced political pieces that we have to kind of wade through um, that our regional superintendents and Dr. Trujillo has to kind of wade through as well. Makes sense. We're going to go to Stacy and then Paul. I just wanted to say with Title I, there's also a big deal about supplanting and moving monies over. So there's a, a lot of those kind of rules too, that when we're, we are trying to figure this out, um, we just need to make sure. Um, I do want to say that I know principals are very aware of this. We are concerned about the loss as we've done this, but, but many of them that I've been talking to um, are already preparing for what we can do. Thank you, Paul. I'd say that uh, Title One isn't very punchable. I'd, I'd be very, I'd be very remiss that we mess with it too much. I'd rather it go directly to the sites. I think that's good for principals to have that latitude. Uh, if anything, we need to decentralize a lot of things in the district. So I, I would, I would highly recommend. We, I mean, the, part of this is, is that now that we've got this weird USB thing that we had forever and it was part of gift and part of an albatross, now it's kind of gone. Now we have to almost reculture the entire district. And so we've got to figure out kind of, uh, remember every single thing was so counted. We were accountable under a court order. We had all these things that we were required, we were required to do now we don't so we have this opportunity to go through this great transition and kind of and, and kind of you know readapt some culture and it's a, it, I, I look at it as an op, op, opportunity so what i tell you is is that uh if we're gonna I, I, my, my sense or my piece is is that we de decentralize a little more uh and and actually kind of have the those regional uh the, the, the three region assistant superintendents have a little more autonomy, give the vice principals and principals a little more autonomy. I think we should transition into a P card system. I think there's all kinds of things we can do, but our biggest aim right now is ultimately we're in the education business, right? Well, that means we really want people on campuses. Uh, we, we don't want to be in a situation where we have too many people off campuses. We want people on campuses. We want people to be able to engage parents, community members, community partners, and students. And uh, the best way to do that is to have people on campus. And so I would be really hesitant to, to look at centralizing something more than that centralizing piece is, an, is a remote auditor to make sure people aren't abusing the system. But, but for the most part, we, we need to give our principals and vice principals some ownership of what they're doing and allow them the latitude to succeed. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Ravi? I just want to speak to Ricky, your point about um, you know, it hasn't gone before the board yet before it comes here. I think that was one of the purposes of the Budget Advisory Committee was before things go to the board to have a committee of individuals, of, of principals, community leaders, teachers, um, you know, other folks um, who can um, vet some of these issues, uh, ask questions, refine, you know, what the talking points are and what the questions might be, um, and really, really do this over a couple of meetings and, and uh, really help the, uh, the admin team, the leadership team, uh, know exactly what's going to come up with questions, you know, from these topics so that by the time it gets to the board, it's already been vetted, it's already been refined, um, the issues have been discussed, you know, for a couple of sessions and in between sessions and after sessions by staff, um, so that and then and having a group of folks making recommendations. So when it comes to us in the winter to make some budget decisions, uh, that there's already some kind of background work done. And especially, you know, background work and questions being asked and this stuff being vetted by folks who are hopefully fresh at, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, as opposed to a 15 minute, you know, meeting at nine o'clock when, you know, uh, everyone's tired and have been, you know, amongst a course of, you know, a dozen other topics uh, in the course of a governing board meeting. 
Um, and so, so I, I think, I think it's, it's, I would think it's, it would be really good for this, you know, to come here first before going to the governing board with recommendations. By the time it gets to the governing board, it's more refined and ready for prime time and questions are answered, topics are discussed and, and some recommendations from, from this, this strong group is, is made. Thank you, Ravi. I think that gives um, a little bit more flexibility to Ricky and his capacity. And so um, I just want to pause just for a moment. There's a few people who, who, who haven't spoken. And I want to make sure that there's space to make sure just if, if there was something that they wanted to share, that they had that, uh, that opportunity. Okay, so respecting that then, um, as let me take a let me switch the screen over um maybe uh so as i look at our um at our agenda what we were um intending to do was to draft uh, have a draft recommendation for literacy and language proficiency um we didn't we really didn't come to that today and that's okay um we will i do think that i want to keep that on the agenda and maybe as we start this work in our next meeting in just a few weeks, <clears throat> maybe we look at that page that staff provided of potential recommendations, and that might be enough to kind of spur some, some thought um, and see if that does. And if it does, then it gets us to a recommendation. And if it doesn't, then we hold that until our final meeting and we may end up kind of running through making multiple recommendations um, across uh, all of the three issues. Um, and there, there was the uh, request for information, um, and I think that we've kind of covered that. Uh, Ricky, um, in your capacity, are there uh, is there clarifying that you need from anybody on any of the points that was made for the request for for what we're needing for our future meetings? No, I I think I've got it. I, I was taking notes as people were kind of asking questions and making comments, so I can definitely relay that back to John and see what what he's got. But if there's anything else that you all think might be helpful to get um, next month uh, so that you, you know, we can certainly, I do appreciate Ravi's point about, you know, if we bring some of this information that would otherwise go to the board beforehand to the committee so that they can kind of, you know, you all can vet and kind of massage that information before we get, I, I completely sympathize with him about the, you know, kind of 830 you know, just droopy eye <laughs> meetings so that can, you know, we want to kind of be bright eyed and bushy tailed about that stuff. So, uh, but if there's anything else, I certainly welcome it. Um, you can certainly email me directly if you'd like, um, if you, you know, you come up with something before the next meeting. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, just as we, as just to make sure everybody has it marked down on their calendars, we scheduled a meeting for the 17th of November. We scheduled a meeting for the 8th of December, and we scheduled our final meeting uh, on the 19th of January. And so we start looking, uh, and I can say, state those again, the 17th of November, the 8th of December, and the 19th of January. Um, so everybody has those calendar. Um, you know, we're, we're halfway through our time, and so that becomes really, um, you know, uh, an issue. Um, before we close things uh, out, Paul, please. Sorry, do we have an opportunity to put on our own agenda items? Like if a committee member wants to have an agenda item, can I have it? That's my, that's actually my question. Uh, I, I'm going to turn that to Ravi as I understand things. Uh, I believe that we, I believe that we were given a charge and that, we're, that we have to stick to those. So it would have to be an agenda item that relates to um, either literacy, ESSER, or capital funding. Um, Ravi, is, is that correct on how the charges work? That's a charge to the committee. So um, we could talk you know, offline too, Paul, if there's something you wanted to bring and do we get board approval, there's time and kind of work on some things also. Well, there's a capital funding piece that I'd really like to see happen where we can, yeah, I think there's a capital funding piece that's that's really important uh, that should be a priority over the next three years. I'd like to I'd like to see that discussed. The other piece I'd like to uh, uh, look, again look at is as 
we talk about literacy and, and, and our ESSER, my big piece will be again to advocate to have as many people as we can at sites and on campuses. Those are the two things that I want to drive home as the importance to this school district and its mission. And that's those are the two things I want to advocate the most. It's not from a perspective of how you know how TUSD should should or shouldn't do business uh, as a TUSD graduate, a TUSD uh, employee, and a parent of three TUSD children. You know I'm going to be here for this district forever. But the bottom line is is that as a council person, we're only as good. This our town is our city is only as good as its school district. So I have to advocate for us to be at our best. Paul, I think so that's, that, a good that's why I wanted to see if I could set some agenda. Items. So um, as 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 I am, am interpreting that, as we talk about capital funding, um, there would be there's there's I mean, that's a pretty big topic. And there would certainly be some flexibility to talk if there's something specifically um, within capital funding that we want to make part. And really what I would say, Paul, what would be ideal is if we make it part of the presentation, um, just like we've had, you know, Ricky shared with the, with us. We had a, a few different staff members st uh, share last meeting that whatever that issue is, and fortunately we have some time to be able to add that to the presentation or not necessarily as if you needs to do the presentation per se, but just to add it to the, the presentation. I think that makes sense. Um, Ricky, did you did you still want to respond? Yeah, yeah. So to just to Paul's question, um, I mean, I don't want to belabor the issue, but just from a mechanic standpoint, anything that needs to be added, like agenda items that are not standard agenda items, they just have to go through you, Jason. They just email, that's in the charter for the committee to be aware of. So if you read up on the charter, anything that you want on the agenda can go through Jason, as long as obviously it's relevant to the charge that the governing board has given you. And he outlined what those topics were. So just kind of keep that in mind, you know, to Paul, if there's something specific he wants to mention and he wants us to study, it's also important for us as the staff to know so that we can kind of come well prepared to, to address whatever questions or items you've got. That's that's perfect. So um, we will circle back to that and make sure uh, as we end the next meeting, because the next meeting we'll do ESSER and then ESSER again, that'll lead into our following meeting. That'll be ESSER and then starting to talk about capital funding. So when we for sure at that point, um, let's make sure whatever that issue is, Paul, that we that the committee isn't well aware, um, even though we will not have talked about capital funding yet, but we'll know that that'll be coming the following meeting. So I think that will be helpful. Um, other things that people uh, would like to would like to see on a uh, future agenda. Uh, this is uh, Serena with Um I, I would like to put in a request um, if we could have um, Heidi Aranda who presented on the MTSS implementation structure, um, because I think there is a kind of a big question within this group about, um, you know, whether under the new structure it's about implementation and for instance we know that mtss works as a supportive structure for students um, but i don't think that um, heidi has adequately presented for us why this implementation structure is more supportive than what we had in place previously and i think that would help clarify a lot of people's understanding of why this is necessary um, for continued funding, um, because it does fall under one of those unapproved um, academic loss um, pieces. And so I would just like to see something more from Heidi on that. Thank you, uh, Serena, that's perfect. Um, and I see Ricky is jotting those down with his wrong hand. Um, you should, I'm just, I'm just saying this, it's either right or it's wrong. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> the last three presidents have been lefties. Uh, okay. I don't know that I don't that's know a, you're making I don't I'm, know I, I, you may be making my point right here. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't to play politics um so uh so then folks I think we're, where we're at we still have a lot of work in front of us um and and I think we're gonna have a pretty meaty uh meeting next month um I, I think Serena's point is is certainly well taken um and and trying to get and, and really it's really asking Heidi to give us the two minute explanation because we have such a you know such a short time together the two minute explanation of you know mtss and and how 
what we've been doing over the short uh, recent past is better or current currently is better than we had done previously. Um, and it gives us a better idea of how and what level we should prioritize. We suggest the board, the governing board prioritizing the MTSS position. Um, so we're gonna get together in just a few weeks. Um, we, if possible, we'll see if we can come forward with a recommendation on literacy. And I think what we'll probably do is early in the agenda, start with that slide, having Heidi potentially um, on that uh, meeting may be able to add some color to that because it's part of that presentation. We'll then uh, go further into the, the ESSER of current and, and Ricky and other staff members sharing some information, seeing if we can get to a recommendation there. But then the second half of that, Ricky, is us going into, all right, what about the future? Um, and clearly there's an overlap there um, and, uh, and go, go, uh, going from there. Um, Albert, please. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Just for, for I'm trying to play catch up here, but are, are the, the presentations that were provided in recent meetings available? Yes. Um, so the the um, we could ask Yolanda if you wouldn't mind um, sending out. I've got it on, but I don't know that everybody was able to hold on to it. If you can send out the literacy um, presentation that we had um, last month, and then. Um, uh, with that, if you can send out Ricky's presentation that we just had, um, and that way then everybody has both of those in one set email. Yolanda, is that something that you'd be able to do? Yes, I can do that. Appreciated. Thank you. Um, Albert, as you, as you go through those things, if something comes through, um, or for that matter, uh, also, uh, you know, and, and Ricky had mentioned this, and we know this is yeah. being recorded. So Yolanda, you could you could potentially also add a link to the recording of the last meeting so that Albert could be part, it could catch some of the dialogue that we had as well. Um, I think that that may be helpful. Um, Ross, I don't know, I, you may have missed that meeting too. Is, I did. Right, okay, yeah, I thought so. So it could just be helpful and there's some folks who missed this meeting. And so the link for this meeting um, could, be, could be helpful. Uh, I get it, everybody's got, got you know, everybody's busy. Um, so, uh, I think we've got ourselves. Thank you for for reminding uh, uh, of that, Albert. That's a, a great point, and I think um, um, helps us to make sure that the people who missed today can also get that information. With that, then, if there's nothing else, uh, I will take a motion to adjourn today's meeting at so moved. Thank you, Paul. If we could get a second, please. Second. second. Thank you. Thank you. I got Serena. Uh, with that, if you'll please unmute. Uh, if you are in favor, and please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Paul. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Appreciate it. We'll see everybody in just a few weeks as we Thank dive you. further into this. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you.